sit down, dear friend, because today we will tell you an incredible story that unfolds like the wings of a giant bird over the godforsaken dunes of ancient deserts. In times when the stars were brighter and covered the whole sky, the sun was painfully hotter and a drop of water was worth more than all the gold in the world. Arabian nights like Arabian days. Stop. This is a slightly different story. But today, we will go back in time three decades to explore all the ups and downs of the legendary Prince of Persia game series. After all, this series recently turned 33 years old, and it still seems modern and makes everyone want to repeat this legendary technique. The game that brought an incredible number of new game mechanics and narrative techniques to the game industry and turned an ordinary children's fairy tale into an adventure epic that still lives in the minds of many generations. What if not desert landscapes, mysteries, games with time, weapons, and parkour encourages players to conquer the world of Prince of Persia? In our today's video, we'll try to explore how Prince of Persia conquered time. What difficulties and obstacles did its creator, Jordan Mechner, manage to overcome on his way to success? And did Prince of Persia sink into oblivion? Ah. You are watching Press X. Don't forget to apply sunscreen and take more tea or water with you because we're getting started. Before we begin, we need to borrow a magical dagger from the main character of the series, the prince, if that is his name, that will take us back in time. Don't worry, we will definitely put the dagger back when we are done. Considering that the game is already 33 years old, we need to go back in time to the beginning of the birth of modern computer systems and game worlds, when all gaming rooms and cafes were lined with slot machines, and probably everyone, large or small, dreamed of never leaving them. Then, in 1977, the ground began to shake under gamers' feet. The world was shaken by a technological revolution in the form of the Apple II. Kids can teach themselves arithmetic. Or the family can invent their own Pong games. The possibilities are endless. It's called Apple II. It was the first personal computer serially produced by Apple Computer. The Apple II was the direct successor to the amateur computer Apple I, which was never produced in large quantities, but already contained many of the ideas that made the Apple II a success. So, just as every self-respecting inventor and programmer does not leave his work unfinished, Steve Wozniak did not leave his invention making Apple II. He's one of the legendary couple of Steves from the garage who, together with Steve Jobs, invented the Apple company. Therefore, if you're watching this video from an iPhone, then you know exactly who provided you with such an opportunity. Wozniak wanted to make the Apple II computer even more functional and faster than the previous model. He also wanted to change the colorless display to a color one and combine the functions of the terminal and memory. And the most interesting thing is that he did it not for the sake of technological progress or increasing attractiveness for buyers, but for the development of our favorite computer games. Here is what Wozniak recalls. A lot of features of the Apple II went in because I had designed Breakout for Atari. I had designed it in hardware. I wanted to write it in software now, so that was the reason that color was added in first, so that games could be programmed. I sat down one night and tried to put it into BASIC. Fortunately, I had written the BASIC myself, so I just burned some new ROMs with line drawing commands, color changing commands, and various BASIC commands that would plot in color. I got this ball bouncing around and I said, well, it needs sound, and I had to add a speaker to the Apple II. It wasn't planned, it was just accidental. Then I thought I needed game controls and added forward, back, and other buttons. Therefore, all functions in Apple II appeared through the development of antediluvian ping pong. Therefore, precisely because of the invention of Apple II in the late 80s and early 90s, the world of the game industry began to change rapidly. Personal computers from Apple and home consoles from NES and Sega Mega Drive began to displace arcade machines from the gaming market. Therefore, on this wave, there was a boom in all the legendary game franchises that we still enjoy playing today. Doom, Heroes of Might and Magic, The Elder Scrolls, Super Mario Bros, and Legend of Zelda. Among them there was our hero of the Persian deserts, Prince of Persia. 
Probably few people now recognize in the very first game of the franchise its successors, but it was Prince of Persia in 1989 which became one of the first games on the Apple II, conquering the world with a new approach to computer animation and setting the trend for third-person games. The father of the cult franchise was the son of Jewish immigrants, Jordan Mechner, who was born in 1964 in New York in the family of the famous psychologist Francis Mechner and the mother programmer. Since childhood, he loved flipping through comics, reading magazines, and watching movies. As Mechner says, if computers hadn't appeared in my childhood, I would have been making comics, cartoons, or something like that. So when his parents bought him an Apple II computer at the age of 15, Mechner really wanted to create animation on the computer. In an interview years later, he recalled that he did simple things at first, like creating a small red block followed by a green block. The rapid development of the digital games cult at the time inspired 18-year-old Jordan to study programming and computer technology. So while a student at Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut, Mechner wrote several games for the Apple II. The first in development was Asteroid Blaster, a clone of the well-known arcade Asteroids, which was submitted for consideration by the studio Hayden Software. But because the original Asteroids was released in 1979 and it was almost impossible to break its popularity, the company rejected the offer of Asteroid Blaster from Mechner. The same fate befell Mechner's second game, Death Bounce, presented to the Broderbund Company, which would later play a big role in his life. Death Bounce is an arcade shooter similar to Asteroids. The game takes place in an arena where the player controls a ship that encounters various bouncing balls and other enemies. But unlike asteroids, there are walls on all sides of the screen from which the ship and balls bounce when they collide. After destroying all enemies, the player receives a bonus and new enemies appear, for the destruction of which you need more hits, and so on. The game ends when the player loses all three lives. Of course, for the Broderbund company, Death Bounce was not commercially attractive, so they turned Jordan down. But the company saw young Mechner's great desire to develop games. So along with the rejection, Broderbund sent him a copy of Choplifter, which was one of the best-selling games in the industry that year, according to Computer Gaming World. Broderbund decided to show Mechner what projects were interesting at the time to users and the company itself. It was through Choplifter that he realized he could create original game concepts instead of rehashing existing ones. After two years of studying at the university, Mechner planned to avenge his first failed attempts to conquer the gaming world, and he came up with an idea for a new game. And I wanted to do a game that would tell a story, so that's when I started uh, programming the game that would become Karateka. Mechner focused on the karate-themed game, which was influenced by Choplifter's graphical features. His ongoing film studies and film clubs at Yale University and the karate classes he attended. He drew inspiration from Japanese engravings of the 17th to 19th century ukiyo-e, which became a hallmark of Japanese culture, and the cinematographic works of the brilliant Japanese director Akira Kurosawa, whose pictures, according to him, quote, convey such powerful emotions and atmosphere without a single word. This is how Karataka was born. The game plot was very simple. Princess Mariko is kidnapped by the evil Lord Akuma, and a nameless hero goes to her rescue. On the way to Akuma's palace, the hero encounters enemies who try to stop him. Therefore, to pass further, he has to fight in karate duels with the guards. The events of Karataka take place in a two-dimensional space. The hero walks from left to right. The player's health and the health of the enemies are displayed as bars at the bottom of the screen, losing one mark for each hit taken. The player's health slowly regenerates outside of combat. The game ends when the player loses all health and has to start over. A kind of homage to the roguelike genre but without bonuses after losing. By the way, we have a separate video about death mechanics in games, so to learn more, follow the link in the upper right corner of the screen, or you can just find the video on our channel. But behind this, at first glance, trivial arcade mechanics of Karataka, there was a lot of hard work. After all, in those days, the Apple II was the main platform for creating games, but despite the fact that Steve Wozniak, the developer of the Apple II, tried to improve it as much as possible compared to the Apple I, the Apple II still had a large number of limitations for game creativity. Poor sound speakers, the screen could display only four colors, and had a resolution of 280 by 192 pixels. Limited memory, the program had to fit in 48 kilobytes. But that's not all. Now you can draw anything in Photoshop or make an animation in After Effects, but then none of this existed. Therefore, to work with graphics and animation, you have to do everything manually and separately create animation for each pixel. 
Such not very rosy circumstances with graphics and animation did not suit Mechner and did not fit into his consciousness. Therefore, Jordan found an ingenious solution to get out of this situation. As a fan of early Disney animated films, Mechner decided to use an old animation technique, rotoscoping. This method was invented at the beginning of all animation, due to a significant lack of artists and animators who could reproduce reliable and realistic movements of their characters. It was also complicated by the fact that all movements had to be repeated 24 times, frame by frame, to create one second of animated video. Therefore, animators, tired of this titanic work, found a simple way out. They began to use the possibilities of a film. The film captured the movements in separate 24 frames, and then the artists took it and redrew all the movements on paper. One example of such a cartoon is Snow White and the Seven Dwarves from 1937. In it, the necessary movements of the heroes were first filmed with real actors, and then they were traced with the help of copy paper. Mechner did the same. He arranged with his karate coach to do all the necessary moves and punches on camera. Then Jordan replayed everything on his monitor frame by frame. Moreover, rotoscoping influenced the fact that cutscenes became a game feature with which Mechner encrusted the game plot. Many other game developers in those years could not afford to create cutscenes. These scenes added to Karataka the cinematic character of the story, imitating images from the works of Akira Kurosawa. They say, everything ingenious is simple. Thus, Karataka at first glance seemed simple, but at the same time, behind this was hidden Mechner's colossal work and ingenuity. In the summer of 1984, Mechner offered the American company Broderbund to become the publisher of Karataka, and the Broderbund could not refuse him. After all, the character animation and cinematic inserts in the game, which were unique at the time, simply glowed with future success. And so it happened. Karataka was released in December of the same year, 1984, and took place in the software chart of Billboard, a popular weekly even today. The game was ranked higher than Fly Simulator and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This brought the project, and young Mechner, who was only 20 years old at the time, great popularity. Therefore, in the summer of 1985, after the stunning success of Karataka, Broderbund offered Jordan a contract job. And of course, he accepted that offer because it gave him the opportunity to do the work he had long wanted to do. And it also gave an opportunity to earn money and not worry about looking for a job after university. A few years before, in 1981, Mechner went to the cinema for the movie that had just been released in cinemas, Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, by the famous director Steven Spielberg. Mechner saw the opening scene of the film where Indiana Jones ran, jumped over a deadly chasm, barely made it, and hung over a trap. The spikes from the walls and other deadly traps in the film impressed the young Mechner so much that after that he only thought about how it could be used in this game. At the same time, platform games such as Load Runner, The Castles of Dr. Creep, began to gain popularity. For the game designer, it was a reason to think about the future game. Analyzing game projects of the time, Mechner realized that the character in platform games seemed to have no weight. If he jumped from a high place, he did not receive any penalty or damage. It was as if he were playing for a balloon. Then Mechner thought, I thought, what if we combine that gameplay with a character who's so human feeling that you feel like if you miss the jump and you fall, it's really going to hurt? Because in the early platform games, characters were kind of weightless. You know, you would jump and you, you would make it or not, but you would float down to the bottom. It didn't feel like you could really get hurt. So my idea was to kind of combine the basic platform puzzle type gameplay in a sort of a modular environment with a very smooth, visceral running and jumping animation that would capture the excitement. So all of Jordan's thoughts came together and formed the foundation of the idea of a future platformer with puzzles and traps, realistic character movements, and paying with one's own life for every failed jump. In Mechner's new project, the player had to really feel pain. This is where the long story of the ups and downs of the Time Lord, Prince of Persia, has begun. The story of the first game of the franchise for Mechner took four long years, but in contrast, the development story may seem a bit trivial because in public it boils down to the fact that Jordan, inspired by the famous collection of Eastern fairy tales, 1001 Nights, and the successful Oscar-winning film The Thief of Baghdad in 1940, decided to work on a game in this direction. However, if we delve into this story a little deeper, 
We'll find answers. Why the plot tropes of Prince of Persia are so fundamental that they conquered people all over the world. It can be said that the story of the Prince of Persia was invented at the dinner table by the manager of the Broderbund Company and the young Jordan Mechner as if it were a real Persian legend. Mechner, who grew up in the American culture of comics, movies, bright pictures, and people who like to tell stories, of course could not avoid the themes of the Middle East. There, retelling of stories and legends are one of the cultural foundations even today. Of course, his choice was influenced by the fact that he did not want to use a Japanese setting in his new game to defer the experience of Karataka. Therefore, Mechner was absolutely serious about the study of 1001 Nights fairy tales, not as children's bedtime stories, but as a material with a lot of narrative techniques and unique characters. One of them was Adventurous Tale, great-great-grandfather of the future prince. Have you heard of this? I think you've seen Aladdin. No, not this one. This one. Hey! 10,000 years! will give you such a crick in the neck. So in terms of content, most adventurous tales are urban fables. Therefore, these short stories usually tell love stories, the heroes of which are rich merchants, daughters of rich kings who are almost always doomed to adventures due to the cunning plans of their lovers. And the peculiarity of such love stories is that the beloved princesses were mostly very poor or homeless at all. And these adventures of silly but kind homeless people still attract us to the screen, making us empathize with the problems of the same Aladdin. Perhaps it has been Mechner's epiphany that a hero is not always a positive character who fights evil, as Marvel movies constantly teach us. That a hero can be anyone, even a criminal with a big heart. Maybe this is far-fetched, but here is what the developer said in an interview about the creation of Prince of Persia. From the beginning, I had the idea that the main character would not fight, that this was a non-violent character just trying to survive in a dungeon, in a violent world. That is, there are spikes that spring out of the floor, there's you know, gates and falling blocks that can crush you. But this is not a violent character. The point is just to get through these traps and get to the end and rescue the princess. The first version of the plot of Prince of Persia was based on a fictional story. Its events took place in Persia. According to legend, the nameless Sultan was at war, so taking advantage of his absence, the wily vizier Jafar tried to seize the throne and take possession of the princess. Jafar imprisoned the princess and gave her an hour to think either to become his wife or die. Therefore, she had nothing left but to wait until her true love, the prince, came to the rescue. In this game series, there were some problems with names. Sultan, Princess, Prince. Why not give them all real names? So this very prince, whom the princess really loved, was thrown into the dungeons of the palace as a prisoner. Now, to free her, he must escape the dungeons, reach the top of the palace tower, and defeat Jafar before time runs out. So Mechner invented a rather unique system of real time in the game. This created tension for the player. Every jump in the game was very important, and every missed minute could cost the princess's life. But the know-how in the game production did not end there. Mechner realized that even though he had used the rotoscoping engine in the animation process for Karataka, the animation still looked rather choppy. Therefore, now the main thing that bothered him was how to make the movements of the future prince smooth and as realistic as possible at that time. The only solution for Mechner was to add as many animations as possible to the game and that each of these animations of jumping, running, and falling had its own graphical representation. To begin with, Mechner made storyboards of all the necessary movements for the planned gameplay on ordinary sheets torn from a notebook. These drawings are still preserved. The process of developing animation for Prince of Persia began in 1985. It was during the boom era of VHS cameras, but of course they were not cheap. $2,500. Therefore, in order not to spend so much money, Mechner decided to rent it for 30 days, and this time his younger brother became the role model for the game instead of a karate coach. But everything was not as simple as they wanted. At that time, there was no mechanism for transferring images from a VHS camera directly to an Apple II computer. It didn't even have a video connector. Therefore, Mechner began to experiment and invented a way to double digitize the material. He took the video player and played the footage of his brother jumping on the TV. 
After that, he put a camera with a 35mm film in front of the TV, turned off the light, and took pictures of his brother's movement frame by frame. Thus, this time, everything was much larger. If in Karataka the animations were limited to a few movements that Mechner could recreate with his own hands by writing the code, now it was necessary to somehow deal with a significant array of film material. The option to do everything manually immediately disappeared. The world was developing very rapidly. Technical progress was inevitable, so it was necessary to do everything as quickly as possible so that the game did not lose its relevance. So, Mechner decided to use his last bit of money to buy a digital converter, a piece that had a mechanism for capturing a real static image and transferring it to the Apple II. And it's becoming more interesting. Jordan took the film, developed it, and began to outline his brother's silhouette in each frame with a corrector and a black felt tip pen to achieve maximum contrast. This made it possible to easily cut the silhouette in the animation program, and then re-registering each pixel for a separate jump and make the picture moving. Therefore, for the next three weeks, Mechner taught the computer to reproduce images, and as a result, everything turned out great. He realized that the game would be a masterpiece, because no one had done it before. Now, the Prince of Persia really seemed to be alive. It's 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 alive. Mechner wanted to add more and more animations, but at the time, Apple II computers had only 48 kilobytes of memory. For understanding, 48 kilobytes is less than a modern email sent. But Mechner had nothing left but to push the universe called Prince of Persia into 48 conventional units of space. Because as soon as the animation of the prince's movements was ready, all the memory on the diskette immediately ran out. After only two years of trial and error and development, Mechner made the game work. Almost everything became alive as Jordan wanted. A free-moving main character, mechanisms for interacting with the interior, like pressure plates, a bunch of traps, falling with hero's damage, and even glasses with an elixir to replenish health. However, time did not play into Mechner's hand, becoming the main problem. These two years became decisive for the project. Computer technology has developed faster than ever before. This meant the death of the Apple II, like the dinosaur of its time. Porting the game to the Sega, Amiga, Compact platforms was another insanity, and if he released the game in the state in which it was, it was unlikely that anyone would buy it. Prince of Persia looked rather empty, and in comparison to the action games at the time, it would simply remain unnoticed. Jordan Mechner's colleague, Tommy Pierce, who was developing her educational program in the same office, shared the same opinion. Every time she was passing Mechner's monitor, she said, Combat, combat, combat. You need combat or this game's not going to be fun. And this frustrated me because I hadn't planned for combat. Karateka was a fighting game. The whole game was you meet a guard, you fight the guard, and then on to the next battle. And so I would explain to Tomi, I can't do that because there's not enough memory in the computer to also have a smoothly animated enemy that does everything that I would need an enemy to do. But when Tomi got an idea, she wouldn't let it go. And so I would add a new feature to the game. It's this directly conflicted with Mechner's idea of making the character completely peaceful and dissolved the concept of a puzzle game, turning it into just another fighting game. In addition to ideological problems, there was also practical problems. All the memory was already used. There was no way to add new characters. Therefore, Mechner rejected this idea. But one beautiful day in June 1988, Tommy Pierce, a modest and fragile girl, accidentally changed the course of the story of Prince of Persia. She had an idea. Why not use the same solution for the enemies as in Karataka, where the enemies had exactly the same graphic model as the main character? That's how Prince of Persia got his enemy, Shadow. This added a significant story twist to the game. However, as much as Mechner wanted to add mechanics to Shadow, he still had to remove almost two-thirds of all the mazes and traps. To give you an idea of the amount of work, Shadow cost the game designer 30 extra levels. Instead of them, there appeared a large mirror which the player could not bypass, and when passing through, a shadow ran out of it. The shadow was an extension of the main character, and if it received damage, then the hero also received it. Also, Jordan made players who played Prince of Persia hate the shadow. After all, he could independently click on the interactive plates in the floor and thus frame the main character, leaving traps for him. Bruh. And to get rid of the shadow, you had to think carefully. Few would have guessed to sheath their weapons and run to meet him, just to regroup. In 
in for a penny, in for a pound, Magner thought, and added a few more enemies to the game. Jafar guards and an immortal skeleton, but using the image of Shadow again for making them would be unprofessional and boring. It would be Karataka 2. Therefore, the inspiration for the animation of these characters again came from the movies. After seeing the scene of the fight in the movie Robin Hood of 1938, which was filmed almost in front, the developer decided to use it. There was very little time left until the release date. Everything looked great. The game was actually fun to play. Gameplay and story solutions were innovative for that time, but technical progress caught up with Mechner. Apple II was almost buried because modern PCs and platforms were much more technological. It practically killed Prince of Persia, embodying Jordan's greatest fear, that the game he'd spent so much effort on would fade into oblivion. On October 3, 1989, Prince of Persia was released on Apple II. Of course, everyone hoped for a miracle, but unfortunately, the miracle did not happen. In the first month after the game's release, it sold only 500 copies. It was a total failure. And not only that, the game was created only for Apple II. Even the game stores began to remove it from sale due to customer complaints about the game cover. The cover of Prince was a real bone of contention not only among the players, but also among the marketers of the Broderbund company. It especially caused negativity in the female part of the company due to too much frankness and sexual objectification. Because of that, the producer of the first part of Prince, Andrew Peterson, who worked for Broderbund and had experience in producing such games as Take No Prisoners and the game series Dr. Seuss, had to write an explanatory note that took up to two sheets of paper. It stated that the cover of Prince of Persia did not promote anything immoral at all in order to calm down angry women. Sellers and buyers also expressed complaints about the sexualization of the women on the cover. What could have been worse for Mechner at that time is difficult to imagine. Given that America has experienced 60 years of the sexual revolution, the period of new Hollywood and cinema, when all censorship in the cinema was abolished and everything was allowed to be filmed, and in addition, America was one of the first countries to publish intimate magazines such as Playboy and Hustler, which are still the largest erotic magazines in the world. Oh my. So, hearing such reviews about the cover was strange and seemed nonsense at the time, although it's noticeable that the fight against sexualization was already beginning then, especially since that image completely fitted into the aesthetics of the culture of the ancient East. But instead of understanding those difficult issues, conscientious players and parents of children simply refused to buy the game. Who knows what can be expected from a game that depicts some episode of the terrible Jafar's harassment of the princess. As you could understand, that also limited buyers by age, because if a parent found their little child playing a game with such a cover, they would call all computer games lewd. <laughs> The solution to the problem was that the artist quickly painted a green cloth on the naked girl's body, which covered everything that was needed. Unfortunately, this did not save sales. The game was actually buried in the ground. But Mechner made a strategic decision. He spent a lot of money and, nevertheless, ported the game to the game platform NES, which at that time had the most popularity. And this decision turned out to be correct and decisive in the history of Prince of Persia. When the game was released on the NES platform in Japan, Prince of Persia simply blew up the entire Eastern market. Already in 1991, the game topped the Japanese game market, selling 1,200 copies per month. For all the profit from the game, Prince of Persia was prepared for release on other devices such as PS, Sega, and Game Boy. Thus, the game had already captured the American and European markets of the game industry. However, after everything that happened to Mechner during these intense six years of development, he thought about it for a long time, and this is what he understood. Is that when you have these two voices, you know, two different approaches in your brain, giving you two different solutions that are diametrically opposed, to really try to tune in to each voice and think, is this the voice uh, you know, of the big picture? Because sometimes you can have great ideas that are kind of taking you off the path of what you originally set out to do. But sometimes that voice is actually putting you back on the path. 
Probably every game and every developer has to go through hell before getting to the Olympus of the game industry. Perhaps this is one of the reasons why Prince of Persia objectively conquered players all over the world. Because as you run through the tingled corridors and try to not fall into a trap or finally defeat the guard Jafar, you feel the sweat and pain. All the sleepless 1001 nights that young Jordan Mechner spent in front of an 8-bit Apple II monitor to give us the opportunity to play Prince of Persia. In the wake of the game's success, all players wanted a sequel. Moreover, time dictated the conditions for the technology development, and fans of Prince of Persia wanted better graphics from the game. Therefore, the next game about the prince, Prince of Persia 2, The Shadow and the Flame, did not have to wait long. As was the case with the first part, but was released already in 1993, four years after the original. It was in the interval between the first and second parts of the game that PCs appeared on the computer technology market, which played high-quality sound effects, music, and could transmit a wide color palette. Therefore, Mechner's goal was to use all the possibilities of new technologies so as not to step on the rake and keep up with the times. At the beginning of the sequel's development, Mechner had already lived in Northern California for four years, surrounded only by offices and industrial landscapes. Tired of working in windowless offices, he decided to move to France, gain strength and inspiration to work on a new game. But while he lived in France, the California company Broderbund took up the development of the game. Mechner played an indirect role in the development. He created levels on floppy disks and mailed them to California, and more from him at this moment was not needed. Mechner's role was no longer so significant, due to the fact that the game Bible already existed. He didn't have to invent anything. All the technologies and mechanics of the characters were known, and it was not difficult to improve the graphics and change the characters' models. The game was released in 1993 and immediately received a lot of positive reviews. Journalist Charles Arday wrote in Computer Gaming World, Prince of Persia 2 not only is in every dimension better than Prince of Persia, but is the cruelest, most infuriating, least merciful. In short, the best game of its type I've ever played, with an appeal that is absolutely irresistible. In June 1994, Prince of Persia 2 won Computer Gaming World's Action Game of the Year award. The editors wrote that it, quote, definitely surpasses its predecessor, and called it a, quote, smoothly animated side-scrolling thriller with cinematic scope, vivid action, and terrifying puzzles. Of course, this time, Mechner was able to implement all the traps and levels that were not included in the first part of the game. So, what was it about the new Prince of Persia that attracted critics so much? The story of the Shadow and the Flame was further inspired by the plot of The Thief of Baghdad of 1940. In the film, the evil vizier Jafar wanted to seize the throne in Baghdad, framing King Ahmad. Ahmad and his friend, the beggar Abu, managed to escape, but they got into adventures with sorcerers, pirates, and a huge genie. With the help of a genie, they restored the princess's memory and destroyed Jafar's plans. Finally, Ahmad returned to the throne and Abu went on new adventures. It was from this story that the developers borrowed many details. Prince of Persia 2 The Shadow and the Flame takes place 11 days after the events of the first game. During this time, the prince has been glorified as a hero who defeated the evil Jafar. But the prince refused all the wealth and instead, as a reward, asked for marrying the princess, to which the Sultan of Persia reluctantly agreed. The game begins with the prince entering the royal chambers of the palace. Before entering, he disguises himself as a beggar. No one recognizes him, and when he tries to speak to the princess, a man who looks exactly the same steps out of the shadows. It turns out that this is Jafar, who has magically reincarnated and orders to get rid of the prince. The prince jumps out the window, and Jafar's guards chase after him. As a result, the prince flees the city on a ship. Falling asleep on the ship, the prince dreams of a mysterious woman who asks him to come to her. At this time, the ship is struck by lightning which was thrown by Jafar. When the prince regains consciousness, he finds himself on the shore of an unknown island. He ends up in a cave full of reanimated human skeletons and is forced to fight them. In the end, he's saved on a magic carpet. Meanwhile, in Persia, Jafar seizes the throne in the guise of the prince. The princess falls ill under Jafar's spell. The magic carpet transports the prince to the ruins of Basra, filled with screaming, flying goblin heads, snakes, and traps. 
Arriving at the ruined throne room, the prince touches the sword on the ground and loses consciousness. He sees another vision. A mysterious woman appears before him again, who turns out to be his mother. She explains that the prince is descended from royalty. He is the only survivor of the Army of Darkness massacre when his parents sacrificed their lives to save him. The prince's sword used to belong to his father. His mother begs him to take the sword and avenge the dead. But always there remained the discipline of steel. The prince rides a magical horse to a red temple populated by warrior monks who wear bird heads instead of hats. There he discovers that the shadow, created during the events of the original game, can now leave his body at will. He uses his shadow to get the magic flame of the temple. At this moment, the bird warriors kneel before him. On a magical horse, the hero flies back to Persia and encounters Jafar. With shadow and flame, the prince incinerates Jafar, thus killing him for good. When Jafar's spell is broken, the princess wakes up and the couple rejoice that they are able to see each other again. The prince orders Jafar's ashes to be scattered. The game ending is a scene with an old witch watching the happy couple through a crystal ball. According to Jordan Mechner, the plot about the old witch and the army of darkness was supposed to be revealed in the final part of the trilogy, which never happened. But more on that a little later. First, let's consider what the shadow and the flame was like in terms of gameplay. The mechanics of the game The Shadow and the Flame did not differ much from the first part of Prince of Persia, where the character made its way through various deadly dangerous places, running, jumping, crawling, avoiding traps, while simultaneously solving puzzles and drinking magic potions. But if you look closely, Prince of Persia 2 has become more focused on fights. In the first game, enemies appeared only occasionally and always alone, while in the sequel, thanks to technical possibilities, up to four enemies could appear at the same time. Sometimes they would appear from the flanks, and even when the hero killed them, reinforcements could instantly come to replace them. As in the original Prince of Persia, the player's goal is to complete the game within a strict time limit of 75 minutes, played in real time. The number of lives is limited, but this time cannot be turned back, like in real life, with the exception of returning to a previously saved game. This is what real life lacks. More significant improvements have been made in other areas. For example, the graphics have become much more complex compared to the rather simple look of the first part. The studied territories and the number of locations also increased significantly. At first glance, everything was so good that Mechner could not believe it. After the experience with the first Prince of Persia, according to Jordan, Prince of Persia 2 was a commercial success, selling 750,000 copies by 2000. But for some reason, with a commercial success on their hands and a brilliant franchise that could be developed further, Brunnerbund and Mechner never managed to make a third part of the game. So what happened? God knows what. This is what happened inside the company. Starting with the scandals with the cover of the first part of Prince, things have already been quite strange. Things finally went sour when a bidding war broke out between Broderbund and Softkey. Briefly, on December 8, 1995, Softkey acquired the learning company in a hostile takeover for $606 million, including taking its name. And having increased the fortune, in June 1998, the Softkey company, which was now called TLC, also acquired a rival company, Broderbund Software, for $416 million. After that, 40% of the Broderbund workforce was laid off. Now, Jordan Mechner's former company, which was the first shelter of the developer, had been renamed Red Orb Entertainment, and the rights to the Prince of Persia series have automatically passed to the new company, TLC. All these disturbances between companies overlapped with the rapid development of computer games. In 1993, the first 3D game, Star Fox, was released by Nintendo for the SNES platform. The game first used a new processor, Super FX, with which polygonal models appeared in games. In 1994, the first PlayStation console was released, which supported games in 3D, and 1996 was a breakthrough in the development of 3D graphics. The company 3D FX Interactive released a video card, Voodoo, that supported 3D acceleration. In the same year, the absolutely legendary 3D games were released. Tomb Raider from the British studio Core Design, under the leadership of Toby Gard, who invented the main character of the game, Lara Croft, 
the most successful heroine of computer games, according to the Guinness Book of Records, and also the equally legendary one-person shooter Quake from id Software, in which the system of dynamic lighting sources was used for the first time. As you've already understood, the 2D world has collapsed. The era of two-dimensional games has come to an end. Glory to the 3D. And that meant that making a continuation of The Prince in the form in which it existed until then made no sense. However, this was not the end of the series. It was 1998. The updated company TLC really wanted to make a statement. Therefore, keeping their plans a complete secret, they decided to make the Prince of Persia game in 3D. The head and producer of the project was Andrew Peterson, who also produced the first part of the series. Jordan Mechner, the father of the series, was invited to the project as a creative consultant and screenwriter. In fact, Mechner simply gave tacit consent to the development of certain mechanics in the future of Prince of Persia 3D. It was probably the best decision from Mechner's point of view, because due to all these frauds with dismissals and the transfer of rights from company to company, it became impossible to catch up with the lost time, in which technologies in the world developed rapidly. Mechner immediately understood that the new Prince would be a failure upon release. The new company wasn't able to do anything better than Tomb Raider, and it was a shame to publish Laura Croft in a turban and baggy pants. Given the small development budget, brutal deadlines, and the lack of interest in management who would like to make the new game a masterpiece, this led to completely understandable consequences. Prince of Persia 3D was released in 1999 and was not quite what fans of the series expected from a new game. The plot of Prince of Persia 3D does not follow the author's canon, but is, in fact, a remake of the original game from 1989, again exploiting the theme of the usurpation of power and the kidnapping of a princess. In the center of the plot, which unfolds sometime after the events of the second part of the game, is the continuation of the story about the nameless prince who unexpectedly finds himself again involved in a coup d'etat. The Sultan, together with the newly married protagonists, prince and princess, visit the kingdom of the Sultan's brother, Hassan, in the south of Persia. The Sultan had previously promised the hand of the princess to Hassan's son, Rugnor. And Rugnor, in general, is... It's not possible. Oh, but it is. She has... Wait for it. Here it comes. Almost there. An identical twin. Yes! Half man, half tiger. And of course, the Sultan breaks his promise. After all, the prince has already married the Sultan's daughter. If you don't understand anything, don't be surprised. There's no answer to the question of why the Sultan gives his already married daughter for his brother's son. Apparently, this was established in ancient Persia, and why the Sasan has a half-tiger son who looks like a bad version of King from Tekken, uh, I don't know what to think. But that's still half the battle. After Hassan learns that the princess is already engaged, he tries to kill the prince, but kills the sultan when he gets between them. Before his death, the Sultan asks the prince to save the princess, but since Hassan accuses the prince of killing the Sultan, he's forced to flee. Meanwhile, Ragnar kidnaps the princess. The princess refuses to obey Ragnar, even cuts off his hand with a sword. Ragnar then decides to kill the princess by tying her to a large cog in his lair. After this plot, it really becomes clear that Mechner was not involved in the project at all. Probably no one would believe him if he wrote such nonsense. The game mechanics have also radically departed from the original. The developers thought and decided that they should focus on the combat system. Therefore, they specially invited two experts, one of whom found weapons for the developers, and the second was responsible for the correctness of the character's movements. Now the prince had more than just one saber. He got a whole arsenal of weapons. Indeed, he was not a hero at the beginning, but as the game progressed, a sword, double blades, and a double-edged staff became available to him, each of which had its advantages and disadvantages. The staff is inferior to the sword in maneuverability, but surpasses it in terms of impact and range, and the presence of two shock blades makes it possible to quickly repeat an attack blocked by the enemy. And most importantly, the prince now has a bow that could summon a swarm of insects directed at the enemy. Even though the developers used new technologies to animate the combat system, it left much to be desired. Among the limitations during combat was the camera becoming static and turning the game into a scene from the 1983 film Robin Hood. Yes, it was this movie from which Mechner drew the animation for the first Prince of Persia. But those were not all the strange limitations and problems that arose during the game. 
Besides the fact that the number and unpredictability of traps in the game remained unchanged, another difficulty was added. It seems that the designers of some game levels simply forgot about the lighting in certain places of the map. In the game, there are really completely dark areas of space that prevent you from passing the level, and this does not look like a special technique. It looks like negligence. But in order to faithfully recreate Persia of the 12th century, the game's visual designer Chris Grun delved into the study of the corresponding era in the history of Iran. This resulted in a rich selection of artistic solutions. Grun's work was also influenced by the illustrations for the Thousand and One Nights fairy tales made by artists of the early 20th century, Kai Nielsen and Edmund Dulac. But all those efforts were completely enslaved by absolutely banal problems with management and lighting. As a result, the game, expectedly for Mechner and unexpectedly for fans of the Prince of Persia series, was a failure. As the father of the series said, the game was dead at the beginning of development. After its release, he stated that he did not consider this game to be an official third part of the series, but some critics still found some advantages in the game. For example, the publisher IGN praised the unique soundtrack of the PC version, smooth animation and high-quality graphics, as well as jumping mechanics. However, unlike IGN, players weren't happy with the jumps in the game, so it's always best to draw your own conclusions about games. As funny as it is, the only award that the third part of Prince of Persia received was Worst Game of 1999 from the publishing house PC Accelerator. However, somehow it happened that in the story of Prince of Persia, failure always leads to something better. Disappointed by Prince of Persia 3D, Jordan Mechner distanced himself from the gaming industry. He began working on Chavez Ravine, a documentary film that told the story of a Mexican-American village that had been destroyed by the construction of Dodger Stadium in Los Angeles. It was unclear to friends of the game designer and fans of the Prince of Persia series when Mechner would return to making games, if he returned at all. I was in one of my several year-long in-between game phases. I needed to charge up my batteries by doing something completely different. While the father of our favorite game series, Jordan Mechner, is preparing to shoot a movie, and we are preparing to move to the next stage of the development of Prince of Persia, we remind you that you can subscribe to our channel and support the release of new videos with your activity. A complete chronology of legendary game series, interesting essays with a lot of important details. You'll get all this by subscribing to our channel, and your likes and comments will accelerate the release of new videos. Therefore, if you like what we do, let us know about it in the comments. Like this video, and we will continue. After the commercial failure of Prince of Persia 3D, TLC was on the verge of bankruptcy. This led to the total dismissal of studio employees and changes in its management. Therefore, in order to at least somehow save the situation, the directors of TLC offered to sell the shares of the studio to Mattel. Yes, this is the same American company that gave childhood to many girls, well, and even boys. It's a manufacturer of toys and still produces Barbie dolls, Monster High, Ever After High, and much more. In case you didn't know, the Hot Wheels line of toys is also the work of Mattel. And since video games mostly captured a male audience, Mattel, with the idea that girls can also play computer games, decided to capture a female audience in this way. Mattel has agreed to acquire the learning company through a stock exchange. The amount of the deal was $4.2 billion. In 1999, the name of the combined company was changed to Mattel Interactive. The studio began to develop games about Barbie. As unique content, games were sold on discs together with Barbie dolls, and they told Barbie stories there. Everything should have been fine, but TLC hid its catastrophic losses after Prince of Persia 3D. Therefore, in 2000, due to financial losses, Mattel sold the learning company to The Gores Group, a private investment company specializing in partnerships with mature and growing enterprises. The total amount of Mattel's losses was about $3.6 billion. As the directors later said, acquiring TLC was one of the worst decisions in Mattel's corporate history. Simultaneously, the development company Ubisoft is developing rapidly in France. In the early 2000s, the company began its fast globalization, focusing specifically on video games. At that time, Ubisoft had already released a dozen different games, from the action-adventure Zombie to F1 Racing Simulation. Among them are two parts of Rayman from Mikel Ansel, 
one of the first game designers of Ubisoft, and today, one of the most iconic personalities in the game industry. Since Ubisoft had already had some experience in game development, they managed to acquire the American studio Red Storm Entertainment. This studio developed games based on the books of Tom Clancy, an American writer working in the techno-thriller genre. Then, after the acquisition of Red Storm Entertainment by Ubisoft, they began to create the legendary series of games, Splinter Cell, based on the works of Tom Clancy. Didn't anyone ever tell you that spelunking is dangerous? Oh no! You are going to kill me, right? Only if you say the word monkey. In 2001, the company acquired Blue Byte Software, known for the Settlers series, games built on the mechanics of city planning and real-time strategy. In the same year, the market became aware of the problems of TLC with their abandoned Prince of Persia. The future general and operations director of Ubisoft in Montreal, Yanis Melot, who was an ordinary producer at the time, offered the management of Ubisoft to purchase the rights to the trilogy Prince of Persia in order to replenish the game library of the not-so-young company, which was about to turn 15 years old. Interestingly, before Giannis joined Ubisoft, he spent his youth in West Africa, namely in Côte d'Ivoire and Burkina Faso. There he received, in a sense, a fateful experience because he got acquainted with the diversity of cultures and formed his leadership qualities. For some time, he was part of the people who provided humanitarian aid to African countries, and later, he returned to France and received an economic education in the field of agronomy. However, Giannis understood that this was not what he wanted to do. His true passion was video games. So when the Ubisoft office opened up in Montreal in 2000, he jumped at the opportunity and joined the team. Thus, Yanis' idea of reviving Prince of Persia in 2001 opened Ubisoft's path to a bright future. However, everything was not so rosy for the young company. The intellectual rights to the Prince of Persia franchise still remained with the father of the series, Jordan Mechner, who did not want to return to this business at all. As they say, the question is out of time. In his opinion, the game, which has experienced so many ups and downs, could not simply sink into oblivion. Therefore, the main thing was to convince Mechner that there was a way out to qualitatively revive the series. Malat began working on building a team and developing a new game design. After several months of work, Malat invited Mechner to meet at E3. Jordan reluctantly agreed. Malat offered Mechner to make the prints again in 3D, which immediately pushed Mechner away. It seems that the very combination of prints and 3D became Mechner's nightmare. However, this was not the only reason. The Bible of the Future Prince, which contained 300 pages, had nothing original. There was nothing innovative. All the same enemies, traps, and running around. As a result, the conversation lasted about three hours, but after it, Mechner did not give a final verdict. He agreed to come to Montreal in a few weeks to put an end to this matter. During this time, Yanis Malat decided to fundamentally change everything and took a very risky step. He fired the old development team and recruited a new one. Creating a new game team was not a very difficult task, since Ubisoft Montreal already had more than 500 employees in the company at that time. It was the second largest studio in the world, right after Canada's Electronic Arts. Although it should be noted that there were a few people who believed in the reincarnation of the Prince of Persia series. Giannis recalls, People from other projects would walk by the team and say, Hey, that's Prince of Persia. It's a dead franchise. Malet still managed to find six desperate people who agreed to risk coming up with something brilliant in two weeks until Mechner arrived. The only thing that Malet understood at that time was that the main feature of the new Prince of Persia should be the unique gameplay, and this gameplay soon appeared after all. The real step forward was when we came up with the idea of the Persian Ninja. Basically, the gameplay came down to the idea of a very acrobatic game environment. Instead of a prince who could only jump over traps, the team imagined a prince who would perform the movements of the hero from the movie Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And the most exciting idea was what the team called the vertical wall. That is, the prince's ability to run along the edges of walls like in The Matrix. With Mechner's trip to Montreal fast approaching, the development team realized there was no time to build a demo. Instead, they decided to create a series of animated tests to at least show Mechner something. Animator Alex Druin was entrusted to work on a series of simple tests. He already had experience as an art director in the game Batman Vengeance, and he also knew a little kung fu. The tests showed a silhouette of the prince running through a blocky environment. There, the developers demonstrated vertical walls and gameplay ideas. For example, the prince's ability to swing on the bars like a gymnast. When Mechner arrived in Montreal, he didn't know what to expect, but he knew that he definitely did not want to hear about the creation of another Tomb Raider clone. Mechner's arrival was one of the most important things happening in the company at that time. Everyone's knees were shaking. When the video of the animation tests ended, Mechner turned to the team, looked them all in the eye, and said one thing. Guys, what I've just seen has reawakened the joy of making video games to me. The ice was broken. 
Mechner gave the go-ahead for the game and signed a contract with Ubisoft to develop and publish the game using his intellectual property. From this moment, the development of the already legendary Prince of Persia, The Sands of Time, began. The whole team was happy to hear the words Mechner told them, but at the same time, they perfectly understood that the real difficulties were just beginning. Now they had to somehow turn the animation into a full-fledged game. In September 2001, the real work on the design of the new Prince of Persia began. Mechner became a consultant on Prince's development and worked from his home in Los Angeles, but visited Montreal from time to time. Therefore, Yanis Mallet acted as a producer, and most of the day-to-day -day work fell on the back of the young creative director, Patrice Desilet. Later, it was Patrice, inspired by the Prince of Persia, who gave us the equally legendary Assassin's Creed series and became a famous game designer. And at that time, Patrice was only 26 years old. And behind him were only a couple of trivial games such as Hype, The Time Quest, and Donald Duck, Going Quackers. So the development of the new Prince became a real challenge for Patrice. Despite the fact that Ubisoft was already a prestigious company at that time, in addition to working as a game designer, Desilet worked as an improvisational comedian. Therefore, improvisation became one of the methods of his development. In improv, you have to say yes to a lot of what people give you, because if you say no, the improv is over. Game design is like that for me. I try to say yes to everyone's ideas and build off of them. During his work, sports games became the main source of Desilet's inspiration. He wanted to adopt the mechanics of context-sensitive character control. In this case, the player's interaction with the environment created 70% of the gameplay. Desilet envisioned the new prince as an action-adventure with the atmosphere of the Tony Hawk games, only with swords and big pants, so that the hero could jump and climb the walls like a flea on a dog. Over the course of several months, the team brainstormed different gameplay ideas. For a while, Ladders and structures were supposed to play a major role in the game that would allow players to interact with them like in Jackie Chan movies. It was the prince's ability to perform some crazy acrobatic moves that was supposed to create the spirit of Sands of Time. In fact, this mechanic later became a classic for game designers and developers of future games in the Assassin's Creed series, which we will definitely talk about later, and all projects that somehow involved parkour. Another gameplay concept was a magic carpet, and an episode was planned where the player would ride a horse and fight enemies in the desert. So, after several months of initial design work, it was decided that the game would basically consist of three main elements. Fight sequences, acrobatic stunts, and a few adventure puzzles. However, according to game producer Yanis Mallet, this was not enough for the new prince. He wanted to add something so unique that it would set Prince of Persia apart from other games, like Australia is different from the North Pole. Patrice Desilet supported this opinion, and he had an idea. Desilet, like any self-respecting gamer, hated dying in games. I remember playing the Donald Duck game, and when I died, I wanted to just go back in time a few seconds instead of having to replay the whole level. Giannis immediately liked the idea of a short-term return in time. In general, it can be assumed that if there was no Donald Duck, there would be no Prince of Persia that we know today. Now, the only question was how to make the mechanics of time manipulation work. After all, this mechanic included an almost continuous game which entailed large volumes of internal data, and on the recently released PlayStation 2, the required memory volumes did not exist at that time. For the answer to this question, Mallet turned to Claude Langley, the lead programmer at Ubisoft. In a way, it was the perfect time to explore such questions. Programmers were deciding what technology would become the basis of a game engine. For several months, the team gravitated towards using the Unreal game engine, but in the end, the programmers, led by Mallet, decided to use Ubisoft's internal technology called Jade, developed in France for the game Beyond Good and Evil. The upside to this was that Langley believed that he could make the rewind function work with Jade technology. And he was right. In the first tests of the engine, the developers managed to achieve the desired result. Now, with a ready-made game engine and a prototype game that everyone was happy with, the first thing in line was the problem of the plot of the Prince of Persia world. The team understood that it was necessary to bring something new to the prince's story. After all, the old idea of a linear plot was no longer included in the game concept. At that moment, Jordan Mechner joined the development team. He offered his help in writing the script of the game. My first task as a screenwriter was to come up with a story related to the gameplay. That is, it was necessary to use the manipulation of time in the narrative. In the game, you can turn back time and in the story to correct the mistakes that caused someone's death. It was about saving loved ones in the character's lives and removing the consequences of your actions. I think that helped the player identify with the characters. Jordan didn't want to turn Prince into a time-manipulating superhero. Therefore, according to the plot, a unique artifact, Dagger of Time, the only thing other than the Hourglass of Time that can hold the powerful Sands of Time, had this ability. The dagger-wielding Prince could now slow down, stop, and rewind time. 
Also, the item could give the prince the ability to see the future, which would help the player follow the correct course in the location. This is how the concept of the future main character appeared on paper, but this was only on paper. Now the question hung in the air, what should the new hero look like? So, Janus Mallet was actively involved in the further big work and began to replenish the team. After a long search, the team found Raphael Lacoste, who, before becoming the art director of Prince of Persia in Assassin's Creed and gaining fame as a concept artist who created amazing 3D worlds, worked as an ordinary photographer and sometimes studied 3D graphics. He immediately began working on the game's overall visuals and character design. Dozens of designs were created for the prince, from a boy in a turban to daring looks with a buff and shirtless look. Eventually, the team agreed that they didn't want to create an animated Aladdin world for Prince. Everybody just kept repeating, sharper, more mature, and nothing specific, but everyone unanimously wanted to see a new Prince with noble facial features that would be covered by the dust of antiquity and the sweat of battles. The next question, which has been related to the artistic decision, what will the universe of ancient Persia look like? It's clear that no one from the team wanted to repeat the experience of TLC with the Prince in 3D, and the idea of creating a game in the cartoon world fell away even after choosing a visual solution for the main character. Therefore, the team decided to delve into the history and culture of the Middle East as much as possible. Everything was in use. Each of the team members began to read and be inspired by the primary sources of the series, the 1001 Nights fairy tales, study mythology, learn about the peculiarities of national ornaments, and in general, what culture was based on. Raphael Lacoste understood he definitely would not want to play in a recreated world in which you feel every polygon of the map and understand that all this is not true. The main idea was to turn the world The Prince of Persia into a picture in which the player would truly experience the story told by the artist, as if you entered a picture gallery and your imagination began to play with the characters drawn in the pictures. Lacoste therefore immediately began pushing for more visual effects in the world, including fog, streams of light, and the physics of objects and fabrics. The last element of the game that needed to be refined was the combat system. The team thought about how to improve the acrobatic movements of the prince, which were present in the first 3D part of the franchise. We started saying things like, well, if the prince can run up walls, why can't he run up enemies, too, during a fight? After all, the combat system was inspired by documentaries about capoeira, a Brazilian fighting style that combined martial arts and stylized dance. <laughs> After the prince's movements and combat capabilities were captured in the prototype stage, the main focus was on level creation, artwork, design, and puzzles. At the beginning of production, a large project board was hung in the office, which contained an overview of the entire game. Each level was represented by a colored index card that could be moved around the board as the order of the levels changed. Kind of like how TV executives use index cards on a board to juggle their primetime schedule. Since Prince of Persia The Sands of Time was conceived as a very acrobatic game, the level design had to be something more original than a bunch of big rooms. The levels were meant to be physical puzzles that required the prince to avoid traps, time his every move, and swing on pillars to advance. In order to create such complex levels, the team went through a series of so-called level drawing sessions. Those designs were literally done from 30,000 feet in the air. We'd look at the top-down view of a level and say, okay, over here there will be a fight, and then over here there will be some acrobatic gameplay with columns. After the design was completed, the team created more than 250 rooms in draft form. Artists created textures and game objects, while level designers began detailed work on creating the actual gameplay. As with any 3D video game, the in-game camera has become an important design element with its own set of challenges. In the first half of the project, the team planned to keep the camera in a fixed position, like in Devil May Cry, but by the end of 2002, everyone began to understand that the camera should move with the player in order to achieve maximum comfort for him. The camera change was minor, therefore the team faced a real obstacle later in early 2003. In January, the programmers realized that the Jade graphics engine, which worked well in the game prototype, was no longer able to support the game's huge levels and detailed visual effects. Yanis Mellet mentions in an interview, The programming team came in and basically said, Yanis, we have some bad news. We need to create a totally new rendering system for the game. Here, we were only months before our debut to the public, and we no longer had a graphics engine. I definitely was getting worried. While the engine change hadn't affected the level design or core gameplay, Mallet and company were walking the fine line of making such significant changes to the game three months before its public unveiling at the Electronic Entertainment Expo. Still, while the team was preparing a demo for E3 that featured several polished puzzle levels, no one knew how fans would react to the new Prince of Persia. 
The father of the series, Jordan Mechner, as a veteran of E3, believed in Mallet's team and was sure that the game would be of the highest quality. Support for young guys who were only 22 to 30 years old and who were one step away from a masterpiece was simply essential. Given the history of their projects, such as the little-known adventure Lara's Happy Adventures, or the platformer Donald Duck Going Quackers, no one expected that E3 would have a crowd of people playing their game demo. Members of the Montreal team were used to being practically ignored at the show. The only guys who came to our booth before were the people looking for somewhere to rest because there was a place to sit down near the Donald Duck game. Finally, the decisive day has come for the Prince of Persia team and for the future of this game in general. Dressed in red Ubisoft t-shirts, the team waited anxiously at the booth to see the first reaction. The crowd flew to the stand like flies on like people after a brand new iPhone. By the end of the first day, the Prince of Persia gaming table section was filled with dozens of fans elbowing each other for a chance to play the game. It was a resounding success, but it was too early to rejoice. Yanis Mallet understood. Okay, we have a good demo, and that's all we have right now. Mallet did not want to be the bearer of bad news. The problem was that Ubisoft expected the game to hit store shelves by November of that year, that is, only after six months. No one in the team considered this release date realistic. Everyone planned to postpone the game release to 2004, and this was possible because in the imagination of Ubisoft's directors, there was already a disc with Prince of Persia on their desk, which was beating all the sales ratings and tops of holiday sales. Thus, after a frantic takeoff, the darkest hours were coming for the project team. According to Jordan Mechner, it was a turning point. The whole game could easily fall apart. However, in order to release Prince in time for the New Year's holiday in 2003, the game's content had to be cut by about 15%. They cut out all the incomplete content, such as the battle on the chariot, which, small spoiler, we will see in the third part of the series, the ability to fly on the magic carpet, and all the levels and locations that did not greatly affect the plot. An even more radical decision was to divide the game into two parts. The first half was to be released as planned, in the fall, and the second, next year. Mechner immediately rejected this idea so as not to destroy the integrity of the story. The most painful thing for the team was cutting the storyline with the giant mythical griffin with which the prince had to meet three times during the game, and in the end have a full-fledged duel. But there was also good news. We know that everything that happened with Prince of Persia happened for the better. According to Mechner, after all the cuts, the game became better. After removing all unfinished and trivial things, it became whole. In October 2003, the team had only 24 errors to correct. While 24 bugs aren't many, everyone knows that the last bugs are always the most elusive. Yesterday was the last time I said to myself that we should push the game to 2004. But after that phrase, I got a big smile on my face. Finally, with one last bug left and only a few minutes to fix, Mallet ordered the programmers to write what could be the final version of the game, and sent it to Sony for review approval. They would check the game one last time before it was allowed to be released on the PS2. Two days of waiting had passed, but none of the team could believe that they had finally finished the game. Every person on the team had the feeling that they had missed some kind of mistake. Soon, Sony sent an official letter saying that Prince of Persia The Sands of Time was approved for release. Hello, I like money. The development of Prince of Persia The Sands of Time can be considered an example of Through the Thorns to the Stars. The team led by Yannis Mellon and Jordan Mechner could finally sleep peacefully. Speaking about the game development in an interview, Mallet said, Two years ago, members of the Prince of Persia team were the people responsible for unforgettable children's games based on the Playmobil and Donald Duck toy series. But now, almost in an instant, these young, inexperienced people have become celebrities. And their game, Prince of Persia, is considered by many to be one of the best games of 2003. Now, it seems the time has come to return the dagger of time that we have borrowed from the prince at the beginning of our story. It's time to consider what the new Prince of Persia The Sands of Time from Ubisoft was about. What did fans of the series see while unwrapping their Christmas presents in what was on the disc? Most people think time is like a river that flows swift and sure in one direction. But I have seen the face of time, and I can tell you, they are wrong. <laughs> According to the plot, the events of the game take place in Persia in the 9th century AD. The main character, named Prince, addressing the player, talks about his adventures. How he, with his father Shalraman's army, traveled through India to visit the Sultan of Azad. On the way to Azad, the prince's father had a plan. 
to attack the palace of the local Indian ruler, the Maharaja, in order to become the Sultan of Azad, not empty-handed. But the vizier who had betrayed his ruler and the people in order to get the legendary sands of time is waiting for the Persian army in the Maharaja's palace. The battle for the palace begins. The prince finds two artifacts inside it, the Dagger of Time and a giant hourglass. The vizier asks for the Dagger of Time as payment for his work, but the prince's father refuses him. Sharaman takes away legendary trophies and charming girls from the palace, among whom is the Maharaja's daughter, Farah. It is her and the largest hourglass that are presented to the Sultan of Assad as a gift. However, at the moment of receiving the gifts, the vizier tricks the prince into combining the dagger and the giant hourglass. Thus, the prince releases the sands of time, turning everyone but himself, the vizier, and Farah into sand monsters. Surviving thanks to magical items, the vizier tries to take the dagger from the prince, but the prince escapes and eventually teams up with Farah to fix the tragedy and prevent the sands from covering the world forever. To turn everything back, it is necessary to insert the dagger into the clock again, but the vizier, now the main antagonist of the story, has stolen them and fled in an unknown direction. Exploring the tangled corridors of the palace, the prince and Farah kill the prince's father, who by then has already lost his human form and turned into a giant monster. While passing complex traps and labyrinths with enemies, Farah and prince gradually fall in love, even though Farah lost her home because of the prince. You know, you're not as vile as I thought you were. Finally reaching the hourglass in the Tower of Dawn, the prince begins to hesitate. Should he follow Farah's instructions to combine the Dagger of Time with the hourglass? After all, he constantly has visions in which Farah steals the dagger from him. The vizier sets up an ambush in the tower, and the heroes narrowly escape, falling into a tomb beneath the city. As they try to find a way out of the tomb, Farah tells the prince a story from her childhood that she has never told anyone, about the mysterious word Kakolukyom, which her mother told her to say when it was very scary. Eventually, after breaking out of the tomb, the heroes find refuge in a mysterious bathhouse, where Farah lures the prince into a large tub, resulting in the two spending the night together. When the prince wakes up in the palace, he notices that Farah has stolen the dagger while he was sleeping. Instead, she left the prince her locket so he could protect himself. The prince follows Farah and barely manages to catch up, as the monsters who've guarded the clock in the battle with Farah push her into the abyss above the hourglass. The prince tries to save her, but Farah lets go of the dagger that the prince has been holding and falls into the abyss. And while the prince mourns his beloved, the vizier offers him eternal life in exchange for the dagger. Only, why have eternal life in which there is no Farah? The prince probably thinks and refuses the vizier's offer. The prince sticks the dagger into the hourglass and time is rewound to the attack on the Maharaja's palace. The prince, still in possession of the dagger and his memories, runs to the Maharaja's palace to warn Farah of the vizier's betrayal. At this point, it is revealed that the entire game is just the prince's retelling of his story to Farah. As he finishes the story, the vizier bursts into Farah's room to kill the prince. However, the prince kills the vizier and returns the dagger to Farah, who believes that his whole story was nothing more than a fiction. As in the best traditions of cinema, the prince passionately kisses Farah, but she reproaches him that she does not remember ever loving him. The prince rewinds time one last time to undo his kiss. In parting, he remembers the secret word, Kakalukium. Just call me Kakalukia. That Farah told him alone in the tomb. Farah, with a dazed look, sees off the prince, who disappears in an unknown direction. It turns out that everything he said was true. In 2003, all fans were very pleased with such a romantic adventure story. This is not surprising because Mechner participated in writing the script. His characteristic cinematic flair is present here and makes the plot of the game so exciting. By the way, it's time to consider what easter eggs and movie references were in the game. The staff of the main antagonist of the game, the Vizier, is a reference to the Aladdin 1992 cartoon already mentioned at the beginning where Jafar had the same snake-like staff. The developers also left a very interesting game secret to the players. The player could find himself on a hidden bonus level in a mini location with a design and appearance of the camera, as in the first part of Prince of Persia. For this, at the very beginning of the game, in the location of the balcony, the player had to enter one tricky key combination. X, space, 
left mouse button twice, E, C, E, space, left mouse button, C. Then he found himself in a rather nostalgic level with traps, and after their passing, he could find a classic sword. And instead of exiting the location, in front of the player was a large hall lined with crates of POP, abbreviation of Prince of Persia beer, and a large picture in the center of the wall which depicted all the developers of Prince of Persia Sands of Time. And there was a secret beyond common sense in the game. Players could use the connecting cable to connect their Game Boy Advance to a device that already had Prince of Persia The Sands of Time running. Then all the main character's health was automatically regenerated. How did they come up with this? But the main feature of Sands of Time was not the Easter eggs, but the gameplay. The highlight was the Prince's story in which the game plot was embedded. After all, such a narrative technique used by Ubisoft was innovative and completely unique. Basically, the entire gameplay of Prince of Persia is the words of the main character, and so the player's death during the passage becomes nothing more than a mistake in the narrative, a misrepresentation of events. Just imagine that when you pause the game, it's just the prince trying to remember something. Besides the innovative narrative, the developers filled Sands of Time with new gameplay features that further refreshed the game. The interaction with Farah, the daughter of the Indian Maharaja, is a novelty for the entire series. If earlier the plot of the first trilogy was based on the rescue of a helpless princess, now the heroine of the game becomes a player's combat friend. And not only a combat friend… well, you got it. Throughout the game, Farah assists the prince by shooting enemies with a bow, although her arrows can also hit the prince. Farah also helps the hero to pass puzzles and traps in the palace, which somewhat resembles the gameplay of the Eco by Fumita Ueda, which was released in 2001. Can you call it a copy-paste? Who knows? And even if it is a copy-paste, its presence in Sands of Time is absolutely justified by the plot. The combat system was also new for the series. It has remained quite simple in performance as it was conceived by the developers at the beginning. The prince has a sword in his arsenal and only a few variation of possible bows, unlike Prince of Persia in 3D where the main character had a lot of weapons in his arsenal. However, in Sands of Time, the player could combine sword strikes with jumps and flips in the best traditions of Bollywood films. And the main innovation in the series is the presence in the prince's arsenal, the Dagger of Time, which allows you to control time in the game by spending the sand of time stored in the dagger's compartments. Sand can be regenerated by killing enemies with the dagger. Killing an enemy restores one yellow compartment of the dagger, or half of the white one. There are also special sources of sand at the locations, passing through which the player replenished all compartments of the dagger completely. You can gradually increase the number of compartments in the dagger up to 10 of the first and second type. The dagger gives four unique abilities. Rewind. The dagger allows you to rewind time, but not for more than 10 seconds, even if the prince is already dead when the rewind starts. For example, a player can rewind a fall into an abyss. Delay. This ability allows you to slow down time, giving the player a reaction advantage while also slightly speeding up the prince and making his shots unblockable by enemies. Immobilization allows you to freeze the enemy with a dagger strike, which creates the possibility of killing the enemy in two hits. The only downside is that you cannot extract sand from it during this. Haste is an ability that slows and freezes all nearby enemies for a short time, giving the player the ability to quickly take out all enemies in a couple of hits. The ability consumes all sand slots from the dagger, leaving no sand behind enemies. Overall, Dagger of Time's capabilities make up for the player not being able to save the game at any point. You can save the game only in specially designated places where sandstorms hit from the ground. Players passing through them also give the so-called vision, which is a kind of hint about further advancement of the level to the next storm. The atmosphere of the world of ancient Persia in the game is created by an incredible soundtrack and sound design. Just listen to this. So, just so you understand, this soundtrack was written by Prince's main composer Stuart Chatwood of the Canadian rock band The Tea Party. Basically, he wrote soundtracks for all subsequent parts of Prince of Persia. Chatwood was chosen for this role because Ubisoft wanted to create music that contained Persian elements to fit the setting while not being purely Persian music. To achieve the desired effect, 
Indian elements were added to the melodies of the Middle East and mixed with rock. Chatwood used various stringed instruments, including the Indian tabla, as well as various female vocal parts. For sound effects, the team collaborated with sound company Dane Tracks. One of the unconventional decisions made by the team was not to pause gameplay during in-game dialogue. That is, the Prince and Farah did not have to stop to talk. All their plot dialogues happened simultaneously with your progress. Besides plot dialogues and jokes on each other, unique contextual dialogues were written for certain situations. In total, more than a thousand lines were written for the dialogues, although more than half of them were cut. The original Prince was voiced by Yuri Lowenthal, a famous American voice actor who also voiced such legendary roles as Sasuke from Naruto, Ben Tennyson from Ben 10, as well as heroes from Diablo 3 and Saints Row. All right. But this time, stay with me and pay attention. I can't spend all day chasing after you. So what was the player's reaction on Prince of Persia The Sands of Time? The game's release day was the second birthday for the entire series. The success of the game was inevitable. Almost a month after its release, sales of Prince of Persia The Sands of Time reached 700,000 copies, and by the end of 2003, the number of copies sold reached 2 million. Critics were delighted. GameSpot editor Greg Cassavan called Prince of Persia The Sands of Time a game we can wholeheartedly recommend, and the publication named it the best game of November 2003 for the GameCube, PlayStation 2, and Xbox. In 10 years, Prince of Persia The Sands of Time sold a total of 14 million copies worldwide. In 2003, the game won the award for Best Action Adventure Game at the Game Critics Awards, and in 2004, the Academy of Interactive Arts and Sciences recognized Prince of Persia The Sands of Time as Console Game of the Year and Platformer Action Adventure Game of the Year at its awards ceremony. In fact, it was supposed to drive the game to all possible sales tops. Yes. It really was in the first place of sales in Europe, but the American and British public surprisingly did not accept the new prince so happily. Well, Britain, they have enough of their own princes, but what happened to America? In fact, at the same time, the release of Max Payne 2 and GTA 3 took place, which firstly were giants of the game industry, and secondly, were culturally closer and therefore more understandable. So, in order to get out of the situation and not get lost among all the novelties of 2003, Ubisoft decided to make gift sets in which players received Splinter Cell when buying Prince of Persia. We can say that Sam Fisher is the main character of the spy series Splinter Cell. He saved the poor prince, who for some reason was constantly beset by incomprehensible obstacles. A year after the game's release, it was even featured in an episode of the famous Canadian TV show How It's Made. In general, it was Prince of Persia The Sands of Time that became the reason why this game series, which was largely ignored after the release of Prince of Persia 3D, regained its popularity in the gaming industry. In the same 2004, Mechner began work on a film adaptation of the game, but this process dragged on for several years. Meanwhile, the Ubisoft team on the wave of success immediately began working on the continuation of the game, as a result of which fans received one of the most brutal, spectacular, and provocative sequels in the history of game development, which quickly turned the tone of the series in a completely different direction. I have laid waste to armies of men. These creatures no mortal should face. Thing. It cannot be stopped. I am pursued by death itself. But this is another story, which we will tell in the next video of our retrospective of the ups and downs of the Prince of Persia series. Probably if it were not for the obstacles in his way, the prince and everyone who worked on him would never have become what they are now. The Prince of Persia is destined to constantly fall, rise, die and be reborn from the sand again and again, even after 33 years since the beginning of the series. So if you're interested in what the sequel to Prince of Persia Warrior Within was like and what exactly happened to the series after its release, write about it in the comments. The longer the wait, the sooner we'll release the sequel. Thank you for watching this video till the end. Please like this video and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. We hope we don't have to use the dagger of time to turn back time and repeat our request. We recommend watching other videos on our channel too. For example, one of those that appeared on your screen now. And that's all for today. You were watching Press X.
Till next time.